Hello, oh, it's you guys again. Hi. Hello. You remember it's from you last again. time? Yeah. Is that what you do? Yeah. What did I talk about last time? Important stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned your. Um, yeah. Don't so you have four kids? I do. One set of twins? That's right. Are they 16? 15. 15. Wow. Um, and then there's two adults. Your two second old oldest ones. is um, like a member of something. Yes. You talked about your <laughs> oldest is going to veterinary school. No. Oh. She, that's, that's close. She started college this year. Exactly. Yes. You uh, fed poor people at Panda Express. That's right. Yeah, remember that. Did I talk about um, uh, my wrestling matches? No. No? No, I didn't talk about that? Oh, good. I'm going to talk about that today. <laughs> but um, your teacher tells me, guys, we're going to talk about St. Thomas. Before I start, I was gonna, I'm going to talk about the, the second part of Mass, the liturgy of the Eucharist, to kind of connect that to your everyday life. But uh, your teacher was telling me, guys, we're talking about St. Thomas Aquinas, yeah. proving the existence of God. Do you know, I, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I'll tell you, and I told the people who came to the talk the other day, this story, um, and, and see if you can relate to, to, to this, okay? It's not, now, some of it may be a little bit over your head, but I don't think so. Just let me be the last part of it. But follow along, because I think it's, it's very relevant to what you guys are learning. Now he goes, remember, remember anybody where I live? What state I live in? Oregon. 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 That's right. I live in Oregon. And in Oregon, there are a lot of atheists. A lot of atheists in Oregon. And I was in a grocery store and I wear my crucifix because I'm not embarrassed or ashamed of my faith. And I was in a grocery store and I was shopping. I was in a, the aisle with the beans and the corn. And I was looking at what my wife wanted me to get. I was looking at my phone and looking at what to get. And this guy in a shopping cart's coming the other way. I, I, I see him out of, I'm out of peripheral vision. I'm not really paying much attention to him. And then the cart stops. So I kind of look over at him, and he, he saw the crucifix and says, oh, you're one of those Jesus freaks. You know, your religion is the cause for all the problems in the world today. And he starts ripping into me. And I just stood there and said nothing. Then after he finished, he said, uh, he, he ends by saying, you can't even prove to me that God exists. I said, okay, well. How about I prove to you that it's possible that God could exist? How about that? He said, fine. So I made some room on the shelf for the beans and the corn. And I took out my cell phone and I put it on the, on the shelf. And I asked him, is my phone moving? Yes or no? You're the atheist. Yes. All right? Is my phone moving? Yes or no? Yes. Why do you say yes? Because the earth is spinning. Because out. the earth is moving, which is what he said. Okay, so relative to the rotation of the earth, I said, relative to the rotation of the earth, is the phone moving, yes or no? No, no it's not, right? So in order for that phone, so the, the laws of physics would say this is an object that is at rest. It's in a state of potential motion because it's not actually moving. So in order to move from a state of potential to actual motion, what has to be imposed upon this phone? An outside force, which is mass times acceleration. So I have to pick up the phone. I have to knock over the shelf, which knocks over the phone. There has to be an earthquake, which shakes the store, which shakes the shelf, which knocks the phone over, or else the phone will stay there forever. Because an object that is at rest will continue to remain at rest unless impelled by a force. He said, yes, that's logic and science. I said, do we have objects in the universe that are moving? Yeah. Yes. The moon is moving. The earth is moving. The moon is moving around the earth. The earth and moon are moving around the sun. We have comets, meteorites, light, all kinds of things that are moving. We just said things don't move unless impelled by a force. So what caused all the motion in the first place? What do you hit me with? Atheist? Big Bang. Big Bang. And I said, amen. Because that's a theory developed by a Catholic priest. No, it wasn't, he said. I said, oh, wait a minute. 
Since my phone is in use, <laughs> get your phone out. Go to Google. Type Father George Lemaitre. Let me spell it for you. Tell me what the search results say. Oh, I said, okay. So Big Bang, what caused the Big Bang? Hmm? Spinning cloud of hydrogen gas and dust. Then where did that come from? God. Hmm? From where? God. No! You're an atheist, remember? <laughs> you can't say God. <laughs> Bad atheist! <laughs> Anybody else care to guess? Yes, sir. Ma'am. I can't see your girl. Your girl. Okay, yes. We're talking about the Big Bang, right? Uh -huh. That the Big Bang started everything. What started what started the Big Bang? What? Hydrogen. No. Hydrogen gas and dust. What's hydrogen gas and dust? Where'd that come from? That came from the universe. And where did the universe come from? I'm not atheist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's here's what here here was this answer. Ready? That was his answer, silence. So I said, you're 0 for 1. I said, let me give you a chance to redeem yourself. We're walking along in the African, in the South American basin, Amazon basin in South America, walking along a hunting trail. I dropped my phone on the jungle floor. Not too far behind me are a group of Yanomamo Indians that are indigenous to that region. They're on a hunting expedition. They see the phone on the ground. They've never seen, felt, touched, experienced anything like this ever. So they look at it, they, what is this? They hit it, a light comes on. Would they think that this phone created itself? Yes or no? Yes? yes. Okay, name something that exists that it created itself. Then how could it create, the phone create itself then? No, they don't know. <laughs> well, would they think the phone created itself? No, they would think a god or an alien or something had to, because why? Things don't create themselves. You create yourself? Did your shirt create itself? Did the tree outside create itself? Can anybody here tell me one thing that exists that created itself? Yes. God. No, you're an atheist, you can't say God. <laughs> and plus, God didn't create himself. God always existed. Right? God is his existence. Then where did it all come from? If things don't create themselves, but yet it's all here, universe, where did it come from? He gave me an answer, by the way. Yes. Silence? Silence? No. That's interesting, though. Yes. Cells? From the universe? That created the universe? They make duplicates of themselves. No. What did he tell me? Gravity. Gravity! That's what he told me, gravity with a smile on his face. Now when he said that, and he, the reason why he smiled, he goes, I got him now, huh? I got him now. He failed to realize that I've read the Four Horsemen of Atheism's books. Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, I read their books. But when he said gravity, that's Stephen Hawking. I read his book too. Stephen Hawking says, because there is gravity, the universe can and will continue to create itself out of nothing. Here's the problem he doesn't answer in his book. <laughs> Where did gravity come from? <laughs> because we said things don't, ex don't create themselves. So if gravity created everything, then, what, then where did gravity come from? <laughs> yes, no, you're atheist. <laughs> I want you to have the experience that the guy in the store had when I asked him these questions. We're going to talk about that in a second. Hold on, brother. Just, woo, just ride a little bit longer. Yes, sir. From the mass of an object. So the mass of an object, what object? Sun, planet. But where did, where, just about, look, things didn't create themselves. The sun was created. Where did it come from? The Big Bang. What, create, what started the Big Bang? Okay, where did gravity come from? Don't say 
God, if anybody's going to say, God, put your hand down. You're, a, you're pretending to be atheists here. Yes. Molecules. Okay. Where did they come from? Okay. No, no. The reason why I say that, because when I asked him about, I said, where did gravity come from? He didn't have an answer, right? So the University of Michigan, we're in Michigan, right? Put out a study about vacuums in space, right? A vacuum is like a void in space, right? So basically a vacuum is nothing. But they said it's made of particles and antiparticles and matter and antimatter. So, ma so nothing is made of something. Great. Where did the particles and antimatter come from? Because they don't explain it in the study. Where did it come from? Uh, atoms. We just said things like, well, where did the atoms come from? They've always existed. If God can always exist, why can't these things that we, why can't the God not just exist in these things that already are here? Because so things, because exist? things are created. They just don't exist. How did God create himself? God didn't create himself. God always existed because he's God. God yes. is existence. Things have to come from somewhere. Sure. God and it all comes from God. God had to come from somewhere. No, <laughs> God didn't have to come from somewhere. Why can't the molecules have come from nowhere then? Because molecules are created. God is not. Where does that reason come from? <laughs> It comes, from, it, comes from, it comes from observation. Albert Einstein came to that same conclusion. Lord help us all. Albert Einstein came to the same conclusion. I don't, yeah. hold, on, hold on, hold on. Let me finish this example, right? So I said, well, and he didn't have an answer. I said, you're 0 for 2. I said, even in baseball, three strikes are out. Let me give you another one last chance. There's a law of thermodynamics called entropy. Okay, let me explain. Entropy measures the level of chaos and disorderness within systems. So for example, a simple example. If you're playing pool, right? And you got the, the pool balls all racked up, nice and tight, right? That's a ordered system. It has a low entropy. When the cue ball, the rolling cue ball hits it, and the energy is transferred from the rolling ball into the other balls, it disperses the balls all across the table, right? That's a disordered, chaotic system has a higher entropy. Make sense? My phone, as it exists right now, is an ordered system of molecules, right? That makes this phone low entropy. If I take the phone and smash it into 100 pieces on the ground, it's now a disordered and chaotic system, higher entropy. Following? So I said, since you brought up the Big Bang, what kind of universe do we have after the Big Bang? An ordered universe or a disordered universe? Disorder. Cosmologists call it a cosmic soup. But do we have an ordered universe today? No. Sure we do. Remember they shot that probe out to Mars? Was it two weeks ago? Remember they shot a big rocket out to Mars? It's going to take a year to get there. They can tell you today, even though it's a year away, the exact orbital trajectory of that object, of the missile, whatever they shot out there. Plus, if they were to land something on the planet, they can tell you right now, within 100 meters, exactly where it's going to land. You can't do that unless you have an ordered universe. When I was growing up, Pluto was a planet. Then a few years ago, they said Pluto wasn't a planet. And then they, but they, they, that probe that they sent out to Pluto like eight years ago got there, and they started taking pictures of Pluto. Then they realize, wait a minute, Pluto is a planet after all. You can't do that unless you have an ordered universe. So how do we get from a high entropy disordered universe to a low entropy ordered universe without a force? In other words, can the, the balls on that pool table re-rack themselves without a force? If I take the 100 pieces of my cell phone that's all over the ground and throw it up in the air, will it come down as a cell phone? Then how, did, then how did it happen with the universe? And that was his answer, nothing. So I said, you're 0 for 3. I said, now you have to apply the law of Occam's razor. Occam's razor says if you have a series of competing hypotheses, each with equally predictive outcomes, the one with the fewest assumptions is the one that's mostly correct. I gave you three assumptions. You couldn't give me an answer. So now you must conclude just from logic and reason alone that my hypothesis <laughs> is at least possible just from logic and reason alone that my hypothesis must be at least possible given the fact that you could not even come up with an answer. 
That was the conclusion Albert Einstein came to. Are you smarter than Einstein? Yes, sir. How long was your conversation with this? About as long as this is taken now. I mean, without all the other stuff in the between. But it, like five, seven minutes. Now, let me ask you something. Let me ask you a question. He, I gave him a series of things he could not answer. Anybody recognize those three examples I gave? The three uses of my cell phone? Yes. So you the Elijah cup? The, there are three of the five proofs that this is a God by St. Thomas Aquinas. Recognize him? Yeah, of course, because that's what you're studying now, right? So why did I do that? Very simply this. If he, if he said to me, you can't prove to me God exists. And I came back with, well, I studied St. Thomas Aquinas. Let me tell you what the five proofs is of God are. He wouldn't have cared. He doesn't believe in God. He doesn't care who St. Thomas Aquinas is. You see? Then it would have made no sense to him. So I have to take this rich, deep, beautiful faith that was given to us like people like St. Thomas Aquinas and turn it into a cell phone. <laughs> right? That's how we effectively get our faith across in the world today. We take the faith that we learn and we have, how do I take this and get it across so that it's meaningful in people's lives today? That's all I do with the cell phone. Prime mover, cause and effect, and intelligent design. I didn't do necessary or greater being because I can't think of good examples for those two. But the three of the five is good enough for this guy, right? Make sense? All right, questions before I go on to the mass. Yes? And what would be next? Next Sunday he went to church? No, 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 no. See, my job is not to convince people of anything. My job, I wasn't trying to convert him. Notice I didn't yell. I didn't scream. I didn't get mad. He was yelling at me. I didn't get mad. I didn't scream. I didn't yell. I didn't, I didn't yell back. I didn't take it personally. I didn't. Because he's mad at an idea, and since I represent the idea, he's mad at me. So what I, my job is to get people to think, get past the emotion of all the name calling, all the other stuff, and make people think deeply and seriously about the position that they hold. My job is not to convert people. God has to do that. My job is just to be present and throw a few seeds and let God do the rest. Easy. But we have to make people think, get past the emotion. Make sense? So that's how you kind of incorporate in the real world St. Thomas Aquinas into, uh, into evangelization. Yes, sir. Do you think? Do you yes, sir. You go to that store? Yes, I go. It's called Safeway. It's right up the street from my house. And I go there all the time because my bank is in there. And when my wife wants to go shopping for stuff, that's the closest place to go. Yes, sir. Have you seen, have you seen that? Have I seen that guy again? No, what I did, though, I said, if you want to talk more about this, here's where you can reach me. So I gave them the number of the parish that I'm assigned to as a deacon. I said, love to talk to you more about it if you want. And she gave him the card. I never heard from him again, but I planted a seed. That's all I got to do. That's it. Just throw the seeds, man. That's it. You got it. We said third thing. What do I think of when I look at a can of beans and corn? No, I think of how, look, how good it's going to look on my plate. <laughs> That's what I think about. I don't know about you, bro. All right. So, yes, sir. How long did it take you to fly here? Or did you fly here? How long did it take to? To get here. To fly here? Yeah. Um, well, I didn't come here from Oregon. So I'm on a speaking tour because it's Lent. And Lent is the busiest time of the year for me. So I was in Florida first. Then I was in Lake Charles, Louisiana for a week. Then I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana for a week. Now I'm here for a week. Then tomorrow I fly to Virginia for the weekend. I'm speaking at a conference. Then I fly home for one day. Then I fly to New Jersey to speak at Seton Hall University. Then I speak at a Byzantine parish, at Eastern Rite Parish. Then I go to uh, Syracuse, New York. Then I go home. Then I'll be home for a week and a half. For eat Holy Week, I'll be, I'll be in my parish that week. Yes, sir. Not Eastern Orthodoxy, Eastern is a Byzantine, it's a Catholic parish. So they're under the Pope and everything. Oh, they are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's 20, there's 23 Eastern right or other rites that are, are that are part of the Catholic Church that are that are, are not the last. So under the Latin we have obviously the mass that you're right, the Roman rite. We also have there's an Ambrosian rite, there's a Dominican rite that are all under the Latin, but then in the eastern side there's 23. Eleven of those are Byzantine. 
So Romanian, Ukrainian, uh, Melkite are of the, of the Byzantines. And the ones that are not Byzantine are ones like Maronite, Coptic, Syro Malabar. Yeah. They're under the Pope. They're, yeah, they have patriarch. They call their bishops patriarch, but they're all under the Pope. All under Pope Francis, yes. Now the Orthodox are outside. They're Eastern too, but they're outside of the communion with, with Rome or with the Pope. They're called autocephalous. So each of those, each of those Orthodox Eastern rites are, are their, they're their own right. They're not subject to anybody but themselves. So they're independent from each other. So they don't, they don't share communion with each other. Even though they're outside the Catholic umbrella, they don't even share communion with each other. So they're called autocephalous. All right? Yeah. All right, so mass. So here's the way I want to kind of introduce you to how awesome the mass is. How many of you are athletes? Awesome. And what sports do you guys play? Volleyball. I was always too short for volleyball. You know, I just couldn't do it. Yes. What? Archery? That's what you don't hear every day. That's a, that's a school sport? Or you do a club sport? Excellent. Very good. Yes. Lacrosse. Lacrosse. That's gaining steam out in the West now. It's big in the Midwest and in the East, but it's getting, getting a lot of popularity out West now. Tennis. Tennis. Excellent. Football. Football. Basketball. Baseball. Baseball. Any soccer players and stuff? My daughter plays soccer. I'm not much of a soccer player, but my daughter. So let me ask you athletes a question. Go to practice? Mm -hmm. Sure you do. Why? To get better. To get better, right? Yeah. Uh, wrong! That's not why you go to practice. Because it's fun. I also... No, no, no. Practice ain't always fun, bro. You don't <laughs> wrestle. I was a wrestler in high school, okay? Only sport I ever did. All four years of high school, I wrestled all year round. So wrestling's a winter sport, so outside of the winter sport, wrestling, I also did freestyle and takedown tournaments. I wrestled all four years, all year round. So I wrestled a lot outside of practice. And I was undefeated in dual meets my senior year. So I think I got pretty good. Hmm? So that's not, the reason for practice, not because it's fun, because I hated every single minute of wrestling practice. Every single minute I hated, right? That's not where you go to practice. You don't go to practice necessarily to get better either. Why do you go to practice? Like if you're in the game, so who's played soccer, right? So you're running around in the game, right? Not, not practice where it doesn't count. In the game where it matters. And you're running around, and you're running around, and the ball's coming to you. Do you have time to stop and think, here comes the ball. <laughs> <laughs> I must now play by foot at a 45 degree angle. I must kick the ball with such trajectory as to place the ball in front of my teammate, or not too far, or else it'll be offside. You got time to think about that? Yeah. No, you don't. It depends on how fast you think. It depends on how, fast, depends you on how fast you think. Really. Yeah. So if you're playing uh, basketball, and the ball, you, have to, you get the ball, do you have time? Oh, I must bend my knees. I must arch my back. I must make sure I have, the, you have time to think about your body mechanics and everything that has to work so you can get that ball in the air? No. So that's why in practice, don't you do the practice the same drills and the same skills over and over and over and over and over again? Yeah. Yeah. Why? What are you trying to build and develop? There's a name for it. So you can have, uh, I don't know what the name is, but it's... That's the name I'm so looking you for. Can, you can, uh, don't have to think about it. Your That's right. There's a name for that called... Muscle memory. Muscle memory. Yes. Muscle memory. You train your body to do the same things over and over and over and over again. So when you're in a game where it matters, where it counts, you don't think because your body is used to that position and your body is trained to react. So you don't have to think, right? That's awesome. Mass is practice. Mass is practice. And in mass, don't we do the same things over and over and over yes. again every week? We receive Jesus Christ in word and in sacrament over and over. Why? We're trying to build spiritual muscle memory. Because what are we preparing for? The game. Where's the game? Not in here. The game's not in here. Where's the game of life, my friends? 
out there, outside the walls of this church, where the atheists are trying to tell you there's no God. Belief in God are for weak-minded people that need a crutch to get through life. Unless you can see, taste, touch, measure, or quantify something, it's not real. They're trying to tell you that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. They're trying to tell you that marriage is something else other than one man and one woman and any children they have together, which is the heart, the center, the nucleus, the core, the foundation of civilization, culture, and society. They're trying to tell you a baby in the womb, it's not a baby, it's a blob of tissue. They're trying to tell you that old people ain't worth nothing. When you get old and sick, like maybe some of your grandparents, they're a burden on your family, they're a burden on the medical system, they're a burden on society. So just, you know, we get two choices. We'll kill them, that's called euthanasia, or we'll give them medication to kill themselves, that's assisted suicide. That's what this culture, that's what you are facing when you go out there. How are you gonna fight against that? How are you? I don't know about you, when I was an athlete, I hated to lose. I don't like losing. And this culture is trying to kill God's life in you, to try to kill faith in God in you. That's what this culture is trying to do. And in order to, to, to compete against that and to battle that, we have to be really good at practice. Let me give you an, a real life example. I was ranked in my senior year in high school, I was ranked number two in the state of New Jersey in my weight class in wrestling, number two. I was wrestling a number five ranked wrestler. So this guy was ranked ahead of me. I mean, ranked lower than me. But the, the Newark Star Ledger sports section newspaper said I was gonna lose that match. Why? Even though he was ranked lower than me, he was bigger and stronger than me, which he was. It was an away match. I'll never forget, Patterson Eastside High School. We're wrestling in his gym. We weigh in and we're warming up. My team is warming up off of the mat. His team is warming up on the mat. Now my team didn't do this, but there were teams that when you pin somebody, you got a big clothes pin and you put it, you pinned it on your sweatshirt. And if you got more pins, you put a, he had a bunch of pins going all down his sleeve like this. All the people that he pinned. And when his team was warm, every time he run around, the team was running around the mat, warming up. And every time he run by me, he'd do this. And those pins would go. Chick, 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 chick. You could hear the pins jingling, and he'd run around the mat. He'd see me just sitting there again. He'd go. And those pins would go. Chick, chick, chick. He's trying to intimidate me, right? All the all the people I pin. I ain't got time for that. <laughs> so we're we're the featured match of the evening, right? So he comes out. People are cheering. I come out. Boo! Boo! I said, I ain't got time for that. Ready? Wrestle. Bam! But we're in it. Now, wrestling is three two minute periods. We're at the end of period number two, and I'm losing by a couple of points, but I know I can beat this kid. I know I can beat this kid. Because all athletes that are really good, they know, right, that 10% is physical. What's the other 90%? Mental. Mental. Right here. So, I'm shorter than him, so I, I, I'm, I've wrestled him for four minutes. I can't outmuscle him because he's just too strong. So I said, okay, I gotta use this. So I'm, in, anybody see wrestling, not WWF, but like Olympic wrestling or like yeah. real, okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm in referee's position, I'm down, he's on top. Now, I was gonna do a move called the stand up, right? Now when you're wrestling, there's two things that you never wanna do. You never wanna create space and you never wanna stop moving, all right? So the way the move was supposed to go, I fire up to here, and I'm blocking his arm, and I've, I've had my hand around his wrist, because his hand's around my stomach, and I create space, which is good for me, bad for him, because I'm on defense. Bad for him, good for me. And then I cut, peel, and attack. That's the way the move was supposed to work, right? That's not what I did. I when the ref blew the whistle, I fired up to here, and I stopped moving, on purpose. He chopped me down, we rolled off the mat. We're going back toward the center of the mat to get back in position. I'm looking at my coach, my coach is going, this means pick it up, I'm like, get down again. Ready, wrestle, I fire up the here again, and I stop moving 
on purpose. He chops it out, roll off the mat again, second time. I go back and look at Coach, is like, <laughs> so the third time, now this guy's thinking he's going to try stand up again. But I know, now I know, when I do the move, I know where his hips are going to be. I know where his center of gravity is going to be. I know where his arms are. I know where his legs are. He's going to counter stand up. So instead, when the ref blows the whistle the third time, instead of doing a stand up, I do a crossover switch. So I put my left hand over my right hand, I bring this hip through, he's countering stand up, I know where his hip's gonna be, I chop his right arm, bring it through his crotch, and then I throw a half Nelson on him so deep that I'm grabbing his chin from the other side of his face. Oh. And when you drive somebody in wrestling, you don't drive them straight, you drive them at an angle. Because it's all about angles in wrestling. So I drove him at an angle, got him off his base, down on the mat, and so I start to crank the half. And when you crank a half Nelson, the more you crank, the tighter it gets. And I crank that half, nice and slow, <laughs> so he could feel every ounce of pain as I was turning him on his back. And right before I pinned him, I whispered in his ear, does your mother have a camera? <laughs> I pinned him. We get up, we walk toward the center of the mat, I go to shake his hand, he comes lunging at me. The ref jumps in between us. I was like, yeah. <laughs> because what was my attitude, my attitude when I stepped on that mat, nobody beats me. Nobody beats me. And your attitude, when you walk out of Mass every Sunday, nobody takes my faith from me. Nobody takes my faith from me. Because you got the spiritual muscle memory from Jesus Christ, who just fed and nurtured you in word and in sacrament, and has empowered you to go out there and live your faith with passion and conviction. No matter what this world says, you live for Jesus. Nobody takes your faith from you. That's your attitude. That's what mass prepares you for. To go out there and do battle for your faith. To stay true to who you are. So that you can truly be the person that God created you to be. Because that's all that matters in the end. What purpose is God? Every single one of you is here for a reason. How are you going to find out what that is? You have to listen to God's voice and allow that voice to change your life. Very simple. So I want to talk about a few things about the Mass. How much time I got left? You guys got to leave at three. All right. A few things about the Mass that you may not notice. Notice when the priest, right? The second part of Mass. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, because we have this bread to offer. And then blessed are you, we have the wine to offer, right? Separately. And then, of course, what Jesus did at the Last Supper, he consecrated the bread and then the wine, which is of course the body, blood, soul, divinity after the consecration, but he was consecrated the bread, consecrated the wine, separately, right? Why? I mean, we see it every week, and then we know Jesus did it at the Last Supper. Why did he do it separately? Why didn't we just do them together, save like 10 seconds at Mass? Why did the priests just do them together? Why separately? Yes? Okay, very good. There's two different things, but there was a deeper reason why those are separated. Anybody want to guess? Anyone want to think? I, well, I'm not the teacher. No, no, no. Let's, yes? Um, the blood is from the fruit of the vine, and the body is the vine that, like, God made. You're almost there, man. That's good. You're almost there. Oh. Um, yes. Okay, yeah, so the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, divinity. But when Jesus consecrated them, why did he separate them? That's what I'm after. You are close. Did you have your hand up over there, brother? Oh, you said what you were going to say? All right, think about it like this. What were you going to say? I don't know if I'm right, but um, so blood and forgiveness. Okay. That's, here's, here's, here's the thing. 
When, remember, how, remember what they did in the Old Testament when they offered a sacrifice? They would kill the sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it was an animal, a lamb, a sheep, or a goat, typically they would, they would sacrifice an animal for a sin offering, okay? But think about it. And the word in Hebrew was zarak. To, to, to slaughter, to shed blood is zarak in Hebrew. So when they cut the animal, the animal bleeds. If the animal bleeds enough, what happens to the animal? It dies. So the separation of body and blood is an action symbolic of death, right? So Jesus separated the body and the blood to show that he was offering a sacrifice. Separation of body and blood is an action symbolic of death. Jesus, I'm going to die for you. I'm separating my body and blood, right? Makes sense. Check this out. What about at the Agnus Day, the Lamb of God? What, anybody knows what the priest does at the Lamb of God? You pay attention? During the Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. We're singing Lamb of God or Agnus Day. We told you Picata Muni right now in Lent. What does the priest do? Doesn't he like break the bread? And no, okay, he breaks. He, it's called the fraction, right? He breaks. But what is it? What else does he do? Yeah, he breaks off a piece of the host and drops it inside the child which has a precious blood in it, right? Why? I'll give you a chance to redeem yourself. He was sacrificed, that's why he separates it, but why does the priest put the host, now, now, now it's not bread anymore, it's Jesus, right? The body, blood, soul, divinity of Jesus, and he puts that into the precious blood, which is also the body, blood, soul, divinity of Jesus. Why does he put those two things together? Because it shows his new life. Yes! Because if the separation is an action symbolic of death, then the reunification of body and blood shows life, that we are receiving the resurrected Jesus. And how does this priest show this in a very powerful way? The elevation, right? The elevation shows resurrection. And what does the priest say during the elevation? He says that the words of John the Baptist in John 1, John chapter 1, verse 29. Remember, John is baptizing people at the Jordan, right? And Jesus comes and he says, he takes attention away from himself and he points people to Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world, right? And what's the priest doing at that point? He's taking attention away from himself and directing people to Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. Behold, he says the same words John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. And the second part, blessed are those called to the, well, in, in Greek, it's the wedding feast of the Lamb, a wedding supper lamb. It's the same word in Greek for feast or, or lamb. So what do we say? Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19, verse 9. Blessed are those who call to share in the wedding feast of the Lamb. Now, why is that Lamb part important? Very, very... Yeah, go ahead, bro. Because he's the... Um, he had no sins. He was never... But where... Exactly. But where does that come from? Uh, it's... Huh? Like, uh, it's... The idea of the Lamb. And, you know, you're right, but where does that come from? That's what I'm thinking. And what's that called when they did that? The Passover. The Passover, right? No, you were you're right on. It's just you didn't know the name. It's called the Passover, right? When they were feeding for exit. But here's the thing. You didn't just have to cook, get the lamb, a male lamb, unblemished, no broken bones. You're exactly right. But what is an important part, component of the Passover? If you didn't do this, you wake up with dead firstborn children in your house. If you didn't spread the blood of the lamb on your clothes. Right, you had to spread the blood of the lamb. So Jesus, the, the lamb of God, spread the blood on the, 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 the lintel and the doorpost. Because what, what, what the priest of the, the father house was the priest of the house. What he would do is spread the blood of the lamb across the lintel and the doorpost, right? So here's how he would do it. The blood and then like this. What does that remind you of? Yeah, huh? That's what the priest would do with the blood in the Old Testament. What else had to be done with the lamb? Or else you wake up with dead kids in your house. It had to be cooked and eaten. Right? It had to be eaten. You had to eat the lamb in order to live. 
And what does Jesus tell us in John chapter 6? Let you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have no life in you. That's why we have to consume the Eucharist. Because he is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And just when you ate the lamb and you saw the blood on the door, the, the angel of death passed over you. And because Christ put his blood on the cross and we consume the lamb of God, death, well, we're still going to die, but death is not the end, right? We're going to move on beyond death to be with God forever in heaven. Beautiful. We also notice that the deacon, because you have a deacon here, during the offertory, he takes a drop of water and drops it into the, oh, it's still wine at that point, right? Into the chalice with the wine, right? You see him do that every week, right? Why? Why does he do that? Yes. It's because when Jesus died, they pierced like his side. Excellent. Okay, that, all right. There's two meanings. You got the first one. Excellent. If you look on Christ's right side, there's a spear mark. When the soldier Longinus speared our Lord in the side, what flowed out? Blood and water. Blood and water, Eucharist, or as some church fathers say, blood for the Eucharist, water for the sacrament of baptism, two of the sacraments that are sacraments of initiation, right, which initiates us into the life of faith. So the church was born from the side of Christ. So the sacraments came from the side of Christ, and the church is always Christ's bride, always she, and Christ is the bridegroom, giving life to his bride, the church. Excellent. What else do you think that water represents? This is a little bit, I have to think a little bit more here. You want a chance? You want number three? Another chance? Sure. You like? Yes. Yes, but I'm going for something a little more specific. Would it be like the wedding of Cana between water and the wine? The wedding of Cana, water and wine? He did that at the Last Supper. Right? But I'm talking about why the, why the deacon will drop a drop of water into... I mean, because think, think about it like this. In paragraph 1354, or 1345, sorry, 1345 of the Catechism, there's a, a partial letter from St. Justin Martyr to the Emperor Antonius Pius. He's explaining to the Emperor what Christians do. One of the things he said, they take a water and wine mixed together. That was 155 A.D. 155. We're in 2018, we're still doing it. So, why? Yes? So water, because that's what, kind of what he said. But what do you think else that drop of water represents? When it goes into the chalice that still has wine. It represents all of us. It represents all of us. That drop of water. Think about it. Think about this for a second. When you drop the water into the wine, right? Can you take the water back out again? Yeah. No. That's the point. That in, and of course it's still wine, but when it gets consecrated, it becomes the blood of Christ. Our union with Christ is so intimate and so personal in the Mass that we cannot separate our lives from Him. Because what does that drop of water represent? Our hopes, our fears, our joys, our sorrows. Everything we have and everything we are are offered along with that bread and wine. And mixed in with that, it's all of us. And as we read in the Roman canon, Eucharistic prayer number one, the angels take that sacrifice to God in heaven. God recognizes the sacrifice of his son and returns it to us as the body, blood, soul, divinity of Jesus Christ. So in that is mixed up. And why does the deacon do it? Let me ask you, who does the priest represent at the altar? Jesus, right? Who does the deacon represent at the altar? Peter? 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 No. Who said that? Yeah, all of us, you're exactly right. The deacon represents the people at the altar. That's why the deacon reads the prayers of the faithful. When the people of God are gathered together, the deacon, who's come from the people and represents the people at the altar, makes the prayers of the people known so they can be prayed for. Deacons have been doing that since the first century. And since the, the, the drop of water represents the people, the deacon who represents the people at the altar is the one who drops the water in. Now, when there's no deacon here, why does Father still do it? When there's no deacon here, Father will still drop the water. Why? 
It's still an important part of Mass, but even more than that, I'm just saying since the, per the, other, uh, the deacon isn't there to do it, so he does it, I'm confused. Yep. Father's still a deacon. That's why he does it. He was, he was ordained a deacon before. Yeah, exactly. He was ordained a deacon. Then he was ordained a priest. But when you're ordained a priest, you, you, don't, you don't say, I'm not a deacon anymore. Because remember, ordination leaves a permanent mark on the soul. So he had his priesthood added to his diaconate. So he's still a deacon and he's a priest. I'm just a deacon, right? The, so the priest is the shepherd. The deacons were the sheepdogs, okay? So he's, he is the, a deacon and the priest. I'm just, so, so that's why he does it when the deacon's not here. He's doing it as a deacon. Make sense? All right, now, the words of Jesus are extremely important. Extremely important. Here's how important the words of Jesus are. The words that Jesus says in, the, in the, what's called the institution narrative, this is my, take this off you, this is my body. If the priest, and if you look in the Roman Missal, they're in big capital letters, those words of Jesus. Why? If the priest doesn't say those words, there's no Eucharist. If the priest does not say the words of Jesus, there are no Eucharist. That's how important the words are. And why Jesus said what he said in the order that he said them. Let's take a look at it. First of all, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. How do we know he wasn't speaking metaphorically? He wasn't speaking symbolically. It's just a sign. It's not really body and blood. How do we know for sure that he was speaking literally as his body and blood? Yes. Because the next day he died, right? But our Protestant brothers and sisters, who I have a tremendous love and respect for, will say, well, Jesus just wanted to have a one last meal before he died. It's just a symbolic meal. And Jesus says, do this. And when we do, we just remember Jesus. That's what they would say. How do we know that that's not correct? Very simply this. I had the great honor and privilege of speaking at a conference in Perth, Australia a few years ago. And I was speaking on atheism. And there were atheists there. And, I, and this, this was a little more intense talk, right? So it's, it's just more than the guy in the store. I was talking about the anthropic principle of fine-tuned universe and multi-universe theory and, and some deeper things that atheists hold. And so some atheists were there. And one of them came up to me after the talk. And he was saying, you know, you, know, you presented your case. And you made a good case. He said, you did it with respect. You didn't talk down to us. You didn't. I said, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I, I, said, I said, what do you do? He goes, I, I teach here at the university. I said, oh, great. What do you teach? He said, Greek. I said, wait a minute. You teach Greek here? He said, yeah. I said, do you happen to have a New Testament in your office? in Greek? Because you know, the New Testament originally was written in Greek, right? So he had the New Testament in his office in the original language of Greek. So I said, can you get, a, can you get the, the Bible for me? I'm, I'm dying to ask you a question. Now, why would an atheist have a New Testament in Greek in his office? It's part of Greek history. Yes, exactly. It's just a form of Greek literature. It doesn't mean anything to him, but he studies Greek, so he has to study the Greek manuscripts, and one of them is the New Testament. So he brought it, and we looked up the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 19. And, we look, and I studied Greek and Hebrew in graduate school. So, so we looked at it in Greek. And right here it says, this is my body. What is going on in that sentence? I asked him like structurally, what's going on? He said, uh, I'll, I'll explain. But he said, the subject of the sentence is making an absolute identification with the object. So here's what he meant. The person who is speaking in the sentence, the subject of the sentence, who in this case is Jesus, is using the demonstrative pronoun this, which is tau te in Greek, to, to identify the object, whatever the object is, with himself. I said, let me be clear. Can you read that and say it's a sign, it's a symbol, it's a metaphor, it's sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, he didn't really mean it, it's just, he said, absolutely not. I said, let me be clear again. 
If the person speaking was holding their own arm or their own leg or their kidney or their liver in their hand and said, that is me, that's what that means? He said, yes. I said, how can you get a different meaning from that verse from what you just told me? And I'll explain. He said, I said Jesus. I knew what he meant. So exegesis is when you look at a text and you extract the meaning from the text. Eisegesis is when you read your own meaning into the text. You see what I'm saying? So that the text doesn't say what it, what it says, it says what you want it to say. So for example, a small example. Everybody heard the Bible, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You ever heard that before? Mm -hmm about the fear of the Lord. Now, if you just heard me say that, fear of the Lord, what would you think am I talking about? Fear of the Lord. No. Oh, wait. Like the fear, what, 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 how would you understand that, fear of the Lord? Oh, I'm sorry. Um. Like, like some people would understand, it's like scared of the Lord. Right, so, so you're, the fear of the Lord is, so you're like, wait a minute, I have to be afraid of the Lord so I could be wise? So I have to be scared of God so I can be wise? You see? Here's the problem. The word is Yahweh in Hebrew, which means honor, reverence, and respect. So what it says is, honor, reverence, and respect the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which makes sense. But they use the word fear, which is Yahweh. It doesn't mean like, <gasps> it's like a filial fear. You know, like you're afraid of your parents. You're not afraid of your parents, but you're afraid of disappointing your parents. Or It's that kind of thing. Not <gasps> fear. But if, unless you understand, unless you exegete and say, okay, I know what that means and get the meaning from it, you're going to read your own meaning into it. You see? Mm -hmm. And that's unfortunately what our Protestant brothers and sisters do. They read Calvin and Luther and the other, Swingley and other reformers into the text, but the text doesn't say that. There's no way around the fact that when you look at the text, Jesus is speaking literally. He literally meant body, blood. No question about that. Now, Jesus also says, do this in memory of me. He does not say, when you do this, remember me. Jesus chose his words very carefully in that order. I'll explain how. First of all, he says do, okay? Now, do doesn't mean like hacer in Spanish, which means to do or to make, right? Or facturate in Latin, which means to do or to make. We talked about sacrifice that you could kill, right? That's called zarak. The shedding of blood is called zarak in Hebrew. But remember, there were some sacrifices they offered that you can't kill, right? What are some of the things that they offered that you can't kill? We know about the lamb, the sheep, the goats, the turtle doves, the bulls. We know about that. But what else do they offer that you can't kill? Flour? Fra yes! Flour! Grain! Right? What else? Flour? Excellent. What else? Um, jewelry, like gold or like No, no. I mean, as an offering to God. Don't, like, Jewish people offer up their first point. No, 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 no. Grain, wine, oil, incense. Those are things that were offered, right? That you can't kill. So you can't use the word for shedding blood for an offering that doesn't bleed. So you have to use another word, asa. So asa means do. It, it, but it's technical Jewish terminology for offering a sacrifice that you can't kill. So when Jesus said do, he used asa. Do this in remembrance. Anamnesis in the Greek, or zacher, ah, ah, zacher. It sounds like you're clearing your throat, right? Because um, in Semitic languages, like Hebrew, there's things called guttural stops. We don't have those in English, so an actual letter is ha, ha, ha. So you have to, so it's like, you know, uh, zacher. It doesn't mean, though, though that's the word for memory, but it doesn't mean remember the past. It's not just, oh, my birthday was last year. I remember that. Oh, I saw the movie. I remember that. That's not what's going on here. Is there anybody here that was Jewish or is Jewish or used to be Jewish and now is Catholic? Nobody? Oh, man. Oh, because I always like to have a, a Jewish person or someone that used to be Jewish 
um, confirm what I'm, what I'm about to tell you now. For the Jewish, remember, because they're celebrating the Passover, right? For the Jewish people, they, even when they celebrate the Passover to this very day, when they celebrate the Passover, are they simply remembering what happened 3,000 years ago in the book of Exodus when they were freed from slavery from Egypt? That's the Passover. Are they simply just remembering what happened back then? No. Mm -mm. Well, you said, you said no. Why? <laughs> Smart kid. That is the right answer. But why? See, here's the beautiful thing about the faith. You just can't have answers for the faith. We need to know why. That's the key. Connecting you to your real life experience with the faith is the why. Why is he right? Very simply this. For the Jewish people, memory, zakir, is something that's alive. Memory is living for the Jewish people. So when they celebrate the Passover to this very day, they're not remembering what happened. They're actually there. Zakir means the graces and blessings of the past are made real and present right now. How do we know that's true? You remember what happens in a Seder meal, right? What is the thing that the youngest, the youngest son says? Why is this night different from any other night? Right, you heard that before, right? One of the things that they say during the Seder meal, the youngest child asks, why is this night different from any other night? Here's how the father is to respond to his child, right? This is 2018. Here's what the father says. And you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of the land of Egypt. Exodus chapter 13, verse 8. That's the response of the father. Look, not... It's because of what the Lord did for my ancestors when they came out of Egypt 3,000 years ago. Here's the answer. What the Lord did for me when I came out of the land of Egypt. That's the response. So for them, memory is living. And, and, and why does Jesus use that language? Because the graces and blessings of the cross are made real and present on that altar for us right now. Memory is alive because Jesus is alive. So what Jesus did is not just remember, do this when you do this, remember, do this in remembrance, in memorial. Leviticus chapter 2 uses the same language for offering sacrifice using the word memory, memorial, zakir. It's alive. Memory's living. And Jesus, because he shed his blood on the cross, he lives to this day. And he gives us his life in the mass so that we can have life to go out there. So I know it's 3 o'clock, right? So I'm going to end here. So when you leave mass, what does that mean? Practice is over. Now it's time to go out there and be Eucharist to the world. You just received Jesus in word, in the readings, and in the sacrament of the Eucharist. But that's not where your journey stops. Mass is over, right? No. In a sense, Mass is just beginning. Because now you have to take the Eucharist you just received and go out there and be Eucharist to the world. And when you do that, what do you think is going to happen? The world's going to fight against you. Because the devil, Satan doesn't want you in church. He doesn't want you in this wonderful Catholic school. He doesn't want you learning about Jesus. He wants you to be just like all those other kids out there that have lost themselves to the culture, that are lied to by the culture, and they have no way to root themselves in anything that's true or good or beautiful. That's why they tattoo themselves. And that's why they pierce themselves. They're hurting on the inside. And they, they put all that stuff on the outside so that when you look at them, you go, <gasps> You're, you're, so you don't have to touch. So you can't get close to what's really going on inside of them. That's why they do that. We have to be Jesus to, to everyone that we meet has to see the face of Jesus in us. And the devil's going to try to stop you from doing that. He's going to try to attack you. He's going to try to lie to you. When that happens, don't worry. Because why? You got spiritual muscle memory. You have the spiritual muscle memory of word and sacrament. So don't worry about the devil. When he tries to come up on you, 
and tries to take your faith from you, don't worry about him. Just throw a half Nelson around his head. And when you're defeating the power of sin in your life, when you're defeating the powers of the culture that's trying to lie to you, you just whisper in the devil's ear, does your mother have a camera? <laughs> right? God bless you guys. Thank you so much.